Hebrews chapter 12 is where we're going to be looking at this morning. If you have a Bible and want to go ahead and turn over there, Hebrews chapter 12. We've been in a series of messages over the last several weeks looking at the topic of faith from Hebrews chapter 11. Uh, that chapter begins by giving us God's definition of faith. Faith is uh, the evidence of things hoped for and the certainty of things that we can't see. And really, if you think about it, it takes, it takes faith to believe in a lot of things. Uh, it takes faith to believe in, uh, in several things we've mentioned over the, the course of this. But with our, our faith in God, we can't see Him, uh, but we can certainly feel His presence. We can't see Him, but we can certainly see the evidence of the things that He does uh, in, in, in our lives uh, and around us. And it's that faith that gives us that certainty of His existence in our lives. And the Hebrew writer goes on from there after giving us that definition to give us 16 different illustrations of men and women from the Old Testament who lived out their faith in, in, in some powerful ways. And the whole purpose of the Hebrew writer in, in giving us these examples examples is so that we can see how to live out our faith because faith always demands action. It always demands us doing something uh, on the basis of our, uh, of our belief. It's not just an intellectual belief. Uh, it's, a, it's, it's got to involve our whole lives, our whole body, our whole spirit. As we've been going through this uh, over the last uh, few weeks, uh, during that time, Kevin preached a revival out at the Trainers Creek Church of Christ outside of, uh, outside of Washington. Now I went over there to hear him one night, and because uh, he always does a good job, I wanted to go check him out. And uh, went over there and was listening, and during his message, he was preaching on the, on the book of Philippians that night, but he used a video... And I got so distracted in the video because it just spelled out everything we've been looking at in Hebrews 11 and made such the, the, the point of our text and the point of the Hebrew writer that I wanted to share that with you this morning before we dive into uh, Hebrews 12 and finish up this series. Steph. Tom Hammond and Craig Mass back, back at Olympic Stadium in Barcelona, coming up to the men's 400 meter semifinals. Here are the lane assignments. Steve Lewis in lane three. Top four to Wednesday's final. Steve Lewis in lane three. Roberto Hernandez out quickly in four. Now down the back stretch. Ismael on the left of the screen is running very, very quickly. And inside of Lewis, Sunday Bada of Nigeria. And Derek Redman of Great Britain has pulled up with an injury. Redman is out. Derek Redmond, the British record holder and an important member of that British 4x400 four meter relay team as he doesn't want anybody to help him. It'll be Lewis to win in 44.50. Look at this. He's going to try to finish his semifinal race. The British have a certain tradition of running which you have to respect a bizarre finish to this first semi-final in the men's 400 meters Derek Redmond of Great Britain pulled up with an injury halfway down the back stretch he's fighting off those trying to help him to finish the race in his lane and now the pain too much. throughout Olympic Stadium as Redmond, with assistance this time, approaches the finish line he had wanted so desperately to reach. That is the Olympic spirit. That's the gospel right there. 
man, that's us. We're, we've got our dreams. We've got our aspirations. We've got our goals. We've got everything out there at the finish line. Like We all have these little finish lines we've got made up, these goals that we want to reach in life, this purpose of life that we're living for. And we're going and we're going and we're going and it's all about us. It's all about our training. It's all about our effort. And then something pops. This guy's leg popped. Something in your life pops and you fall down. And, and, and you fall flat on your face and everybody has fallen flat on their face in life. And you get up and you're like, man, I've trained so hard. I'm going to finish this thing. I've done so good. I've got, I can do this on my own. I'm strong enough. I'm stubborn enough. I'm whatever enough. And we keep going. And we, we push through whatever type of pain and whatever type of turmoil. And then we realize that this whole junk we've got going on in our head, it's all a lie that we really can't finish on our own. And then it has to take the Father coming and grabbing us and picking us up and getting us refocused on what the goal really is. It's not gold. It's not to stand on top of a podium. It's just to get to the stinking finish line. It's just to finish the race. And, and we, we start to say, okay, this is, this is now my goal. This is my priority in life. It's just to get to that finish line. And with the help of the Heavenly Father, He, he gets us there. Man, that's the gospel. As Kevin was playing that uh, video out at uh, Trainers Creek a couple weeks ago, I was watching that. But the thing that stood out to me that night was, was one thing in particular. And it, it's what reminded me so much of, of, our, um, of our text. And that is the fact that the crowd. Did y'all hear the crowd in that video? Those folks were cheering louder for the man that came in last place and limped across the finish line with help. When somebody touches you and helps you, you're disqualified. He, he was uh, technically disqualified from the race. They cheered louder for them than, for him than they did for the guy that won the gold medal. They were just they were there and they were they were cheering him on. And I got to thinking about that thing. Said so that's what the Hebrew writer has been writing about in Hebrews chapter eleven. He describes it for us in depth in chapter twelve, the first couple of verses. If you have your Bibles open there, look what he says there. He says, therefore. Since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race that is marked out for us. Our Christian walks are, are frequently in the New Testament described as a race we're running. And here he's got this picture of this race and, and we're going on and we're not competing with anybody else. We don't care who's in the lane beside us. We're not trying to beat them. We've all got the same goal as Christians. We're just trying to get to the finish line. We're trying to get to that finish line in Jesus. We're trying to get to that finish line uh, of heaven. But as we run, he shows us in this picture of Hebrews 12, we're not alone in our running. In fact, there's, there, there's other people that are on the track with us. They're all running. But there's also this great cloud of witnesses, this great cloud of witnesses that's in the stands, and they're observers, and they're watching us. And we see that there are these great men and women of faith from the Old Testament that, uh, that we've been reading about in Hebrews chapter 11. And they're sitting in the stands, and they're watching us, and they're cheering us on. I love this. I, I can't read this passage of Scripture without thinking of my granddaddy. My granddad died, uh, my dad's dad died when I was just, I was a little boy. And in our, in our house, in our living room, we had some pictures that were hanging on the wall. And everybody in those pictures, they were all alive except for my granddad. He was the only one that was deceased. Everybody else, we could have picked up the phone. At that point, we would have had to call long distance, you know. That was still such a thing on a house phone. But we could have still talked to him. Or we could have went and visited him with, visited with him. My granddad was dead. Couldn't go, and, couldn't go and talk to him, couldn't visit with him, but his picture was hanging on the wall. And I don't know if y'all have any pictures like this, but his, in this picture, it was like a little portrait thing. His eyes, they followed you. Y'all know what I'm talking about? Y'all ever seen a picture like this? It didn't matter where you were in the room, granddaddy was looking at you. And uh, uh, you could start out over here. And you walked across, and Grande's eyes, I don't know how that happens. Like, I'm sure there's some reasonable explanation. But it was like the eyes were moving in that picture. And as a little boy who just knew that Granddaddy isn't here anymore, I had conjured up in my mind that since Granddaddy ain't here, Granddaddy is watching me through this picture. Now, I knew logically this wasn't the case. But in your little kid mind, these things are, man, this is real. And what that did is it provided some accountability. Like I'd walk in the living room, see Grande's picture, and I'd stand up a little bit straighter. 
I'd think about what I was doing. I would think about what I was saying. I, was, I would think about my actions. It provided just that picture and then my eyes moving along with it, just knowing that, you know, he was watching. It provided some accountability. Well, that's the picture that the Hebrew writer is painting for us, except this is all real. This is all real in the, in, in the heavenly, in the spiritual realm. We've got these people, this great cloud of witnesses, these saints of old that have gone down before us, and they've gone through the same race, and they've gone through the same struggles in their lives, and they've every single thing that has tripped us up and has caused us to fall flat on our faces, they've done the same thing. They've had those same experiences in life, and now they're sitting in the stands, and they're cheering us on to get to that finish line so that, so that we can have that extra extra little bit of accountability as they're, as they're watching on. The scripture says, therefore, since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin, the sin that so easily entangles us. This is not a mistake. It's not a mistake that God mentions sin that so easily entangles us in this passage where he's talking about this great cloud of witnesses that we see that, that are coming down before us. Think about who we've talked about over the, the past few weeks. These, the, we, we focused on a few of these men and their lives and the faith that they had over the past few weeks. We talked about Moses. One of the things that Moses is most notorious for is his slip up and his anger. You know, he, he, he led the Israelites through the wilderness for 40 years, got them right on the brink of going into the promised land. He had one momentary lapse of judgment and struck a rock with his staff when God had told him to speak to it out of anger. And the Lord said, as a punishment, I'm not going to allow you to enter into the promised land. This guy's in, he's sitting in the stands and he's cheering us on. And every time he looks down on our lives and he looks down on us and we're struggling with our anger, that we're struggling with our temper, we're struggling with our attitude. We've got Moses up in the stand saying, please, I, I, I'm begging you, I'm cheering you on. Don't give into it because I know what it's like to just have a momentary lapse and get out of your character for just a little bit and then deal with the repercussions of that for the rest of your life. He knows what that is. So through his experience, he's cheering us on. How about David? David, we read about uh, one of the most notorious things with David in, in this great man of faith is his affair with Bathsheba. He's looking down from the stands of us and every time we're tempted with sexual immorality, he's looking out and saying, please don't do this. You don't understand that you are about to ruin your family. You're about to cause hardship on a whole lot of other people in life. You are about to put yourselves and a whole lot of other people through some purity hell on earth. Please Please abstain and just don't get involved in this in this momentary pleasure because it's not going to be worth it. That's who we've got cheering us on from the stands. We've got Noah. Noah hopped off the boat. This is crazy. God saves Noah, puts him on the ark. You know, he builds this thing. He hops in there. God saves him from a worldwide flood. Him and his wife, his three sons and, and their three wives, eight people in all. That's all that's left. Waters come down. Door opens. What's the very first thing we read that Noah did? He went out, he planted a vineyard, and he got drunk. You know? Here he is. Every time that we're tempted with some type of substance, whatever it is, for Noah it was the alcohol, for you it might be drugs, it might be some type of pill, it might be whatever it is, it might be the bomb. Every time he's sitting there and he's saying, look, don't give in to this temptation. This is a guy that's sitting in the stands. All these guys, they knew what it was like to be tripped up over different things in life. And these are the people that are sitting in the stands. They're, they're cheering us on. It's a cheering that gives us some accountability, but it's, a, it's accountability that's backed up with experience. And that's so valuable. That's the accountability that we've got. It says, therefore, since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance this race that's marked out for us. In verse 2 it continues, and let us fix our eyes on Jesus. He's the prize. He's the finish line. He's the goal. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning at shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. I love this. This is good stuff. So here we've got this great cloud of witnesses, and who's there among them? Jesus. And Jesus is, we see, sitting there in the stands. He's sitting down. I love his posture, how that's mentioned. 
the symbolism here is for a purpose. It's to show us that Jesus' work is done. Earlier in Hebrews, it mentions that Jesus died once for, his, once for all. His atoning work on the cross, it's done. He doesn't have to die for you every day that you get up and, and commit a different sin. He died one time and the power of his blood is so, it's so powerful that it can forgive all the sins that you've ever committed, all the sins you're committing right now, and any sin that you'll, you'll commit in the future. That's how powerful the blood of Jesus is. So we see him sitting down at the right hand of the Father. His work's done. He's sitting in the stands. You ever been to a football game, though, and just like you kind of wanted to sit down and watch it? You, just, you didn't want to stand up. It's probably not a football game you went to when you were 20. It might have been one you went to when you were 40, and you wanted to just sit there, you know? And I just, just want to watch the game. But you're there, and, 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 and you're in the stands, and you're watching and your team's got the ball, you know, and it's, it might be the fourth quarter or whatever, and, and everything, you know, y'all need to score. And your team's got the ball, and they give the ball to the running back, and he gains two yards. And everybody sits there, and they clap. Yay, we got two yards. Then the quarterback gets the ball on second down, and he throws it, and it's an incomplete pass. So that's all right. Third down. They hand it off again because the coach is dumb, and they hand it off again on, on, on third and eight, and he gets, he gets three yards. Now you're at third and five. You're going to have to punt again. Well, lo and behold, coach leaves everybody, leaves the offense out there. What's everybody in the stands do on fourth down? Everybody stands up. This is a pivotal point in the game. And even if you don't want to stand up, like maybe there's a few in front of you that aren't, you're like, good. You're kind of peeking through there. But then on fourth down... Quarterback drops back. He's got the ball. Lo and behold, there's a receiver. He's cutting down the side. That man's open. The ball's in the air. Now what's everybody do? It don't matter if you wanted to sit down. Now you don't want to sit down anymore. Everybody's standing up. Everybody's cheering. Everybody's begging the man, please, please catch the ball this week. Don't drop it like you did last week. You know, please. And we're, we're just begging and we're cheering. And the guy catches the ball and he's got 20 yards. Nobody between him and the end zone. And it's just standing up and everybody's cheering because it's a pivotal point in the game. Well, Jesus is in these stands and he's watching. And at the pivotal points in the game, he's not always sitting. In Acts chapter 7, we actually got an example of, of what makes Jesus stand up. It's the stoning of Stephen, the first, the first Christian martyr. He was being stoned to death for his faith. He had went out and he would preached in the name of Jesus. They said, no, don't do it anymore. So he preached harder. They said, you need to stop this. So he kept preaching harder. He said, you, you keep doing this, we're going to kill you. So he keeps preaching harder and harder in the name of Jesus and keeps telling them about the power of the resurrection uh, of Jesus from the dead and what that can mean in our lives. And finally, in Acts chapter 7, verse 55, it tells us that they'd had enough, they picked up stones, they were about to stone Stephen to death for preaching in the name of Jesus. And it says that Stephen looked up and he saw Jesus standing at the right side of the Heavenly Father. He wasn't sitting anymore. This was a pivotal moment. He's in the stands. He's cheering Stephen on. And in, in the next verse, it says Stephen looked up and he says, Look, I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of the throne of God. And you can almost hear Jesus cheering him on. You can almost hear Jesus in that, in that passage cheering Stephen on. He's just saying, mm, Be faithful. Just be faithful for a little bit longer. This is going to hurt, but endure the pain. This is going to hurt, but endure the trial. This is going to hurt, but it's all going to be over with, and it's all going to be worth it in just a minute. And as Jesus is standing there cheering Stephen on to be faithful to that point of death, they stoned him to death. And the very next thing that Jesus does is he's standing in heaven, we know, as he got to embrace Stephen. And Stephen, he got to the finish line. He finished his race. That same cheering section that Stephen had, I don't know if you know this, but you've got that too. And when you're going through your junk in life, in your race, and you trip and you fall down, or you run into, into some type of, of obstacle, you've got that same cheering section all around you. This great cloud of, of, of heavenly witnesses, they're looking down on you, and they're cheering you on when life gets hard. When it gets real tough, they're standing up. And they're cheering you on. And when you fall down, they're encouraging you to get back up and, and, and to keep on going. All this is happening in the spiritual realm around us every day. Sometimes we can feel this, can't we? Sometimes, sometimes we can't, though. One of the roles that we've got 
outside of the spiritual realm and in the physical realm is that we've got a responsibility in this in ourselves as the church, as Christians. And that's to help people feel the power of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And the way that we get to do this as Christians is we get to be that, that voice of encouragement in the flesh that people, that people can hear with their own ears. That pat on the back that, that they can see with their own eyes. And one of the responsibilities that God has given us as Christians is to encourage those brothers and sisters in Christ that are, that are constantly, that we're surrounded by in life. When somebody falls down on the track, we ain't trying to get there in a certain time. It's all right to stop for a minute and help somebody up and help them to the finish line. It's all right to stop and, and give a word of encouragement. And that's what we need to do when somebody falls down. Hebrews chapter 11 is all about putting our faith into action. And one of the best ways we can do that is we can just encourage one another. When, when somebody needs it and we see it, just step up and offer that encouragement to keep, help them just keep on going towards that prize that we have in Jesus Christ. I don't know everybody's situation here this, this morning. I know some of your situations. I know some of you have been struggling. And, and you've been struggling and you've been, you've been verbal about it. You've let folks know about it so that we can encourage you, so that we can pray for you. Some of you are battling stuff and, and it's secretive stuff. You, you've kept it in. You've kept it bottled up. And, and sometimes it, that, that's all right. And sometimes it's not because people don't know and people don't see and they can't step up and, and encourage you. They can't be there for you when you're, when you're going through something. I want to do something a little bit different as we, as we close out our, our service this morning. We're going to have an invitation hymn. The ladies are going to come. They're going to, uh, they're, they're going to sing. But I'm going to, I'm going to ask you, if you're here this morning and you're struggling and you need prayer, just come. Uh, just, just come this morning and let us pray for you. Let us encourage you as a church. Let us lift you up uh, because... That's the picture that we see from Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews 12 tells us about this great cloud of witnesses that we've got. Let's do our part. Let, let, let's, let's do our role in this as well in this ministry. Would y'all stand with me as we pray and as we go into this time of invitation? Father, I just pray that you'd be with, uh, you'd be with everybody here this morning and those that aren't able to be here. Uh, Lord, or, or those that have just chosen not to be here. And we just pray that Lord, as we're going along on our Christian walk, that those that are struggling, if, uh, if they need encouragement, Lord, that they'll come now. Uh, it, that we can wrap our arms around them, that we can love them, that we can pray for them. And uh, Lord, just encourage them to go on towards that prize in Jesus. Father, we thank you for what he did for us on the cross. We thank you for his message to us and uh, just the message that you give us through his word that it doesn't matter whatever we've done in life. You're willing to forgive us. Uh, you're willing to forgive us if we'll just take those steps uh, of walking towards your redemption, of putting our faith in you and uh, being willing to confess you as Lord and being baptized in your son's name and, and just repenting of our sins and living for you. Father, we just thank you for this opportunity that we've got to pray for one another, to encourage one another, and, uh, and just be there for one another in Christ. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Good morning, Gold Point family and junior church kids. I'm so excited to bring you another lesson on the theme of Bible basics. As we've looked for the last few weeks, we've looked at a lot of different parts of our Bibles. One thing that we looked at is the first five books of the Old Testament. We looked at Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. We also looked at the next five books, which is 6 through 10. And we see Joshua, Judges, Ruth, 1st and 2nd Samuel. And then we stopped there, and we also looked at the New Testament. We saw the first four books uh, called the Gospels, and we saw Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And then we saw the book of Acts, and it talks about the history and how we are first called Christians in the book of Acts. And so we've looked at a lot of different things. We've seen different parts of how when we read our Bibles, as we read them, we can see that they have big and small numbers. We have the big numbers, which are chapters, and we have the small numbers, which are the verses. We, if we don't know where a book is, we talked about the table of contents and how the, the, the table of contents tells where the books are and what page they are on. Last week, we looked at Jesus and we looked at who Jesus is and what he's done for us. And then we also looked at the different books and all the different 66 books of the Bible. This week, we're going to kind of transition a little bit. And as we talked about Jesus last week and the Gospels and what they say, we're going to look this week at some of the teachings that Jesus teaches. 
As we look at these, we're going to look at these for the next few weeks and better understand what these things that are called parables are all about. And so as we get started, we're going to look at the book of Matthew chapter 5 this morning. And we're going to look at a parable, or it's actually the Sermon on the Mount. But we're going to look at what Jesus teaches us in this Sermon of the Mount. And so this particular part, he talks about two main things. He talks about salt, and he talks about light. Let's see what he says. The Bible, in the Bible, we're going to look at Matthew chapter 5. And the first thing he talks about is salt. Now, let's talk about salt for just a second. What is salt used for today? More than likely, if you eat something and it may need a little bit of flavor to it, you may add a little salt and pepper. One of the things about salt is that it gives, uh, it gives, it gives flavor to the whatever it may be that you're eating. It also does this, and it does this more back in the day, but it preserves. It helps something stay longer fresh. Okay, And so nowadays we have refrigerators and freezers and, and different ways that we preserve in that way. But back in the day, they would preserve it by using salt. And Jesus is going to explain that in just a second. The second thing that we're going to understand of what Jesus is talking about is light. Light is something that's important. If you look at salt and light, they're both important. They're both valuable. They're both used for specific things. And so we're going to understand that both of these things are used in specific ways. You ready? Here we go. Matthew chapter 5, starting in verse 13, it says this. You are the salt of the earth. Well, let's just stop right there. What does Jesus mean by you are the salt of the earth? One thing that he may mean is that you are important. Salt was important. We talked about how it preserves, how it helps last and helps uh, keep fresh and keep good for a longer period of time. Maybe God, maybe Jesus is saying here that you are salt, meaning that you are good and that you can change the flavor of what it may look like. That we show the change, the flavor in the sense that that we can show Christ to other people, that we can change. Paul says this, he says to not conform, to be like the world, to be transformed, to be different than the world. And so if you add salt to your meal, uh, it changes the flavor of it. It changes it. And it keeps things longer. And so maybe it's this idea that Jesus is saying, look, you are the salt of the earth. You're different. You're special. You help preserve. You help, you help keep fresh. It says, but the salt loses its saltiness. How can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. Here's two things I want us to understand about this passage. Number one, that we're special. God created us in the very beginning. We see that God created man and he created woman and he created our moms and dads and our grandparents and our aunts and uncles and, and everybody and all our family and, and different people, everybody special. That we have unique gifts and talents, but we're all created by God. That God created us special but, and unique, but yet also the same. That God says that we are made in his image. And so as we look at this, number one, we're special. God created us in a special way. But number two is this idea of preserve, that we don't conform to the world, but we transform. We are different. We are like just the same way when we use salt and make something taste different, in the same way we're different. And we read our Bibles and we better understand the basics of the Bible. And when we do this, we are people that we can, we can transform we can change the world in the same way. So as, as Jesus talks about salt and how salt is used for, to preserve and it's used for difference in taste and stuff like that. He says in the same way, but if salt isn't being used in a proper way or if it's not salty, then what's it used for? He says it's not used for anything. And then he goes on and he says in verse 14, you are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Now, if we had light, if we had, uh, maybe right now I'm using light to be able to shine so you can see me on the screen. It, it may be at night before you go to bed, you have a night light to put in that is plugged in so you can have a little bit of light in your room. It may be outside when you're playing. You love being able to play outside in the light with the sun shining. Sometimes we may be scared of the dark. Jesus says here, you don't, you don't light a lamp or you don't, you don't turn on a light and put a shade all the way on top of it to be able to, so it doesn't shine. No, you want that light to shine. 
And Jesus says here that, that we are the light of the world, that that light is there for a purpose. And each one of us has a purpose. Instead, they put it on a stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. Jesus says that you light the, that you light the house. You, you put it on a stand. You put it up high so it can be able to light everything around you in the same way. Just as we are sought and we preserve and we, we show we aren't just conformed but we're transformed in the same way that we show light. That we show the light of Christ to other people. And that we don't hide it but yet we show it. In the same way, let your light shine. Each one of us has a light. Each one of us has a light of Christ and we need to shine it. We see what Jesus says in the Bible and what other people have written in the Bible for us to be able to shine our light. We shine it before others. Not to show us, but listen, that they may see your good deeds and who? And glorify your Father in heaven. Salt, light. Jesus says that salt is to preserve, it's to last, it's to help, to be able to make things taste different. In the same way, we as Christians are salt. We, we preserve, but yet we show and we don't conform, but we transform. We change the taste buds. We change what it tastes like. In this world, we change people. Not because of us, but because of what Christ has done for us. The light we don't just put it on a, we don't, we don't put it under a bowl. We put it on a stand and we let the light shine.